Hello again, everyone. This is Professor Casey. Welcome back. Today we're discussing Chapter 20 from George Emery Shy's America and Narrative History. This particular chapter has to do with America's first foray into international politics, uh, and specifically whether or not America is engaging in what is known as imperialism. Okay, and this is the period to the very, very end of the 19th century leading into the 20th century. Um, and imperialism is a large movement that occurs over, uh, over the course of several years during this period and is something that several different major powers in the world engage in. Um, and we'll talk about some of the specific qualities of what imperialism entails uh, and uh, we can kind of determine for ourselves whether or not America is actually conforming to this. If you look back at the history of the United States before the Civil War leading up to it, um, America, you will probably notice, has not really been engaged in many foreign conflicts of any kind. Uh, the last major conflict the United States had with any foreign power to speak of was the War of 1812. Okay? And uh, again, the struggles that America has had with other foreign powers are primarily with European powers like Great Britain and with France. Right? Right? Those are really the only two major world powers that we've come into conflict with thus far. Once we get to the end of the 19th century, though, we start to see America attempting to expand its boundaries uh, past the continental United States, and that leads us to come into conflict with other foreign powers as well. Okay, so this sense of isolationism that we've seen in U.S. politics throughout the 19th century is really starting to go away now. Okay, we're starting to grow more, as you can see here by the political cartoon in the background, from infancy into uh, a larger and more um, corpulent United States here toward the very end, right? We have so much power uh, and uh, seem to be uh, essentially growing fat with success that we are uh, we're getting a little bit bolder in, in terms of our foreign policy and so forth. So we'll start to see how that starts to have repercussions now. And because we've been such a fledgling nation up until this point, we haven't had a very stable economy, we haven't really been able to take care of ourselves up until now, um, there's been a big uh, desire to keep out of any kind of foreign conflicts, right? We've just barely scraped by two victories in the last couple of wars, and even the War of 1812 itself really didn't have any clear victor involved. Um, there's no real clear resolution of the conflict itself, what got us into it in the first place, and really if there was any kind of benefit to us um, uh, coming out at the very end of it at all. The other major thing, too, is that um, the United States really hasn't had much of a navy to speak of up until now. Um, it's existed in name only from the end of the revolution, and so really we've only had one or two instances during the War of 1812 where uh, the U.S. Navy has made any kind of an impact at all to speak of. And so it's really been designed as more of a defensive um, presence on the on the coastal regions of the United States to prevent any kind of foreign powers from invading in any regard, but we haven't had any kind of navy that has been able to go out and meet conflict on the open sea yet. Okay, and so the Royal Navy has been really in charge of that portion of things. Okay, the Royal Navy has been the strongest navy anywhere in the world for probably about the last 400 years or so at this point, right? From right about the end of um, the period where the Spanish Armada is destroyed uh, by the British, the British end up stepping into that role as the strongest navy, and they've continued it ever since. And so the navy has been the one protecting most of the shipping lanes between the U.S. and England and Europe in general. Um, although we really haven't done a whole lot of business with Europe. Remember, there have been so many tariffs been, that have been put in place by the Republican Party um, that uh, at this point, Europe has kind of withdrawn most of its investments in the United States. So we've been in an isolated uh, role for so long that um, some people are starting to say that we need to climb out of that a little bit. And by the 1880s, the sense of imperialism that we mentioned before is something that is starting to come into more and more prevalence all over the world. Um, and it's primarily European powers uh, that are monarchies that are engaging in this. Okay? The British in particular are the ones who kind of corner the market on imperialism uh, toward the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. 
Um, but other European powers like the French, the Belgians, the Italians, the Dutch, Spanish, and finally the Germans are finally starting to get into this a little bit at this point, are all engaging in imperialism. And what imperialism basically is, is you have a central power that is expanding its territory to other foreign nations, invading them, suppressing them, and establishing colonies there. Uh, and these colonies can then reap uh, natural resources to ship them back to, uh, to the main power. So it's kind of like setting up uh, little satellite colonies all over the world. And again, the British are the ones who seem to have the most success at this uh, by now, and part of it has to do with the fact that they have such a strong navy that can ship these natural resources back and forth. And so the saying goes that during this period in time, the sun never set on the British Empire, right? It had so many uh, colonies all over the world that no matter where the sun beams down, part of it is controlled by Great Britain. And so, uh, in particular, the two main targets for imperialism during this point in time are Africa and Asia, right? two uh, areas of the world where there are tons of natural resources that are virtually untapped right now, and who are um, largely, uh, at least in the case of Africa at this point anyway, are undeveloped. Okay, so places like Asia are already kind of getting into a little bit more of a westernized culture, right? They're starting to uh, adopt certain, you know, western customs and clothing and technology and so forth. Um, but imperialism also has a, a lot of pitfalls involved with it. Um, uh, ethnocentrism and racism uh, and slavery are certain all, certainly all parts of it, unfortunately. Um, so once you see an imperial power coming in and conquering a nation, quite often they end up suppressing local culture, uh, trying to get people to assimilate to the conquering culture, um, and whatever culture is already in existence uh, there ends up being uh, possibly even suppressed to the point of dying out altogether. Okay, So there's a lot of um, suppression and oppression involved with imperialism. Okay, uh, and once we see the the age of imperialism beginning to end, um, we we see especially at the end of World War One, a, a lot of imperialist powers uh, start to get pushback from from these native groups that are are not pleased at all with the presence of imperialism. So anyway, in a nutshell, imperialism has its real um, peak during this point. In 1890, um, Alfred Thayer Mahan, who is the president of the U.S. Naval War College in the United States, uh, writes a book that becomes extremely influential when it comes to U.S. foreign policy during this period and kind of begins, uh, again, our little foray into imperialism. And the book is called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, okay, from the years 1660 to 1783. And what he posits in this book is essentially a blueprint for how the United States can uh, uh, ascend and be achieve status as a world power. Okay. And he uses Great Britain as the model for this particular um, way of doing things. Okay. First thing he states that the United States needs to develop is a powerful navy. Okay. And again, we've already established that we have a defensive navy, but we need to expand the technology, begin to apply some of the industries that the United States has uh, begun to develop in the 19th century uh, to the military. And he says, and this was supposed to include things like battleships, um, ways that we can actually, again, meet a, a potential enemy on the open sea if we have to, okay, instead of just taking a defensive position. And he says that in order to um, expedite shipping lanes for the United States, um, he says we need to construct a canal connecting the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. Okay? And this is what leads eventually to the construction of the Panama Canal. Um, if you see down here on the map this little um, kind of dark brown portion, this tiny little thread that connects Mexico and Central America uh, down here to Colombia, this is Panama, right? This is the, um, the smallest uh, peninsular point uh, that we have in between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Okay, so if we can create a shipping lane in between these two, this uh, prevents us from having to sail all the way down to the southern tip of South America and up the other side. Okay, so it uh, leads to a lot more, uh, again, a lot more expedited shipping lanes. To wit, the other thing that we need to add to this is a sense of global mercantilism. Okay, and mercantilism is something that we uh, have seen in history way before this point. Okay, mercantilism is 
uh, it has kind of controversial beginnings and it's a little bit of a different form now than what it originally was but the original form of mercantilism is where the government directly controls all elements of shipping right all elements of commerce okay? uh, individuals throughout history like Oliver Cromwell for instance who very very briefly took control of England uh, during the 1600s uh, was a was an advocate for this kind of thing and it comes with a, a little bit of a dictatorial sense of power uh, attached to it so it, it has uh, kind of uh, kind of confused uh, status and all this but in this particular case what we're talking about is primarily um, engaging in more foreign commerce than we have before okay and because the United States has been isolated for so long at this point um, the the powers that be are basically looking at things and saying, well, if we want things to expand outside of the continental U.S. Uh, to our advantage, then we need to actually have a presence in a foreign market. Um, and combined with that, we need a merchant marine as well, right? We need to develop our own um, shipping lanes with U.S. ships that can then be protected by a navy as well. Okay, so there's a lot of different uh, elements and moving parts that need to go into this. And finally, we need to establish colonies of our own. Okay, and again, the the primary um, reason the colonies exist is to harvest some kind of a raw material to potentially create new markets in those areas. Right? If uh, you know, if local populations are willing to engage in that, or if uh, if they can you know extend to other foreign markets that are not uh, immediately accessible, and to construct naval bases as well for defensive positions all over the world. Okay, so again, this is uh, this is taking things to a whole new level, right? We are again, it's uh, the the word is expansion that goes along with all of this, right? Just expanding U.S. territories, U.S. borders, and influence in the world at large. And of course, one of the other more famous individuals from this time period is Theodore Roosevelt. Okay, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt has been made the Assistant Secretary of the Navy at this point in time uh, under William McKinley. Um, and Roosevelt uh, has this sense that manifest destiny, which we've already discussed, uh, is something that is uh, can not only be applied to us getting to the the western borders of the United States, but also can cause us to go overseas. And unfortunately, Roosevelt is very much a product of his day. Okay, he has this sense that this encompasses some sort of a racial destiny uh, for whites. Okay, and again, for for this particular time period, the the general narrative, as we've seen with things like the um, the frontier thesis and so forth, is that this sense of manifest destiny is really only out to benefit um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in most cases. Okay, so it's a uh, from his position, it benefits him, but very clearly, it ends up uh, overlooking several other uh, individuals in the process and populations in the process. Um, and again, there is still this um, corruption of the Darwinian theory that has been turned into social Darwinism, which we talked about in chapter 19. Uh, people are beginning to use uh, science and social theories to try to legitimize uh, whatever exploitation they can enact on other people, um, right? Saying that you know these people have uh, clearly not developed certain technologies or certain social principles comparable to what we do. Um, and so we now have the ability and the authority to overtake people and suppress them, essentially. So this is the, the key justification for, um, for imperialism throughout this period, no matter what European, or in this case, United States power, is actually engaging in it. And of course, racism, as we've already established, is finally beginning to be justified now by several different scientific or pseudoscientific um, principles, unfortunately. So we get studies like phrenology. Uh, phrenology has to do with uh, literally looking at the, the bumps on a human's uh, skull and trying to determine if you know a, a certain uh, shape in a certain person's head indicates a certain personality trait or propensity toward intelligence or not. Um, physiognomy, of course, is something that goes along with that a little bit. This harkens back to the more Enlightenment era um, ideologies. And physiognomy is specifically looking at the shape of a human body. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, very naive form of pseudoscience because it basically indicates that if you are uh, somehow irregularly shaped or too um, 
uh, if you're not if you're too asymmetrical in your body proportions, or if you have some uh, some kind of physical uh, deformity, whatever the case may be, looking at you and saying that your your exterior shape somehow uh, is indicative of your interior um, essence as a human being, right? Right? Is a is a person who is uh, allegedly physically ugly, you know, in you know emotionally ugly, that kind of thing. So it's a it's a very again it's a very naive way of looking at things, and obviously very very inaccurate as well. Right? It's it's judging the book by its cover is essentially what it is. And then craniometry kind of goes along with uh, phrenology. Okay, craniometry is the study specifically of the shape of the human skull uh, as a whole. Okay, and this harkens way back to even um, not just Enlightenment era principles, but also even like classical Greek uh, and Roman principles. Right, people would look at the shape of a human skull and say, "Well, this is the ideal proportion." Right, this is um, you know on par with the statues of the gods that we have, and so forth. And anybody who has a, a you know a, a, an elongated forehead, or you know if your if your head is, is a slightly different shape than anyone else, then you know maybe you are more or less of a human being as a result. So there, there's a lot of very um, inherently wrong ways of thinking that goes along with this. And uh, unfortunately, these are the, cut, the types of science that, um, that accompany this type of imperialism to other countries. Okay? And especially if you're targeting people who are ethnically different, who have uh, you know, evolved in completely different circumstances than Europeans, right? each human being looks vastly different from the one standing next to them. Okay, so this is a, it's, it's too easy for, for Euro Europeans and for uh, Americans at this point in time to begin to adopt these types of principles. The first place that the United States begins to look at specifically, now that we've gotten all the way to the West, is to start to look uh, at the Pacific Ocean and specifically the Pacific Islanders. Okay. Um, beginning about uh, 20 years before the time period in question in 1878, um, the United States signs a treaty with uh, with the Samoan people. Okay, and the Samoan Islands are way down here in the Pacific. Uh, it's it's difficult to encompass all the Pacific Islands uh, on a single map that can fit on a slide this size. But you kind of see here, based on the little um, kind of a, a globular shape of of the world, right? The U.S. mainland up here in the, the the northwest corner, and then the Samoan Islands are way down here, very small compared to everything else. Um, and this uh, treaty that we sign with Samoa gives us a distinct advantage, right? We're granted a naval base at Pago Pago, which is down here. It's kind of the, the central, um, uh, kind of their, their capital region at this point anyway. Um, anybody who is an American citizen who is living in the Samoan Islands is granted what's called extraterritoriality. Um, and what this basically means is if you are a U.S. citizen living in Samoan territory, you are not subject to Samoan laws. You are subject to U.S. laws only. Okay? So if you do something that infringes on uh, Samoan culture, it, it's a loophole for the United States to you know, enact its own laws on you rather than the Samoan people doing it. There's, of course, exchanges and trade concessions, so basically saying, you know, the, the Samoans are going to give, you know, a certain amount of uh, natural resources to the United States. We will give you certain technologies. We will give you certain products and so forth. Um, and the Samoans at this point uh, are, again, because the islands themselves are relatively small, the Samoan people look to the United States as something of a, of a protector, uh, basically saying if the if the Samoans get in trouble with any of their neighbors or if any other European powers come knocking, uh, the U.S. is responsible for resolving any disputes. Okay, so the U.S. Uh, apparently has a, a, enough of a military and enough of a um, strength at this point where it can actually act upon those types of things. Um, and by the time we get to uh, the next decade or so, uh, Samoa engages in a civil war in part because of this little treaty that it ends up signing with the United States. Right? Not everybody is pleased with it. Um, and there is finally a peace conference that happens in 1889. And the outcome of this is that um, the Samoan Islands end up in a, a joint protectorate with uh, the United States, with Great Britain, and with Germany, who is now becoming a world power as well. Okay? Germany has only just industrialized within the last you know, 20 or 30 years or, or so, and it's 
had such uh, rapid industrialization that it's catching up with uh, with a lot of the other world powers. Okay, so U.S., Great Britain, and Germany are the three primary strengths in the world at this point. And going back a couple of years, even before we end up engaging with Samoa, we end up in a trade agreement with Hawaii as well. Okay, uh, and the agreement is essentially an exchange for. Um, it, we grant Hawaii U.S. protection, and then we get Hawaiian sugarcane, uh, and of course other products like pineapple and so forth, uh, as um, you know, as as brand new commodities. Okay, and Hawaii has been in uh, existence as a kingdom since 1795. It's been organized as such, um, but by the time we get to the 1890s, there have been so many uh, arrivals of. Uh, Europeans and even individuals from Southeast Asia um, that uh, of course just like we saw with Europeans coming to mainland United States for the first time a lot of illness ends up coming with them and so uh, you know several different epidemics like smallpox and so forth end up wiping out much of the native Hawaiians who were living on the island in the first place and by the time the 1890s comes around Asians become the ethnic majority on the islands okay so Ethnic Hawaiians are in a, a state of minority at this point. Uh, Queen, queen Liliuokalani is the name of the, the last queen of Hawaii, uh, and she is doing her best at this point to try to preserve whatever independence Hawaii still has um, because she realizes that there is a, a gradual encroachment of, of European powers and, um, and uh, U.S. citizens who are coming to Hawaii and you know, doing the imperialist thing, right? They are, they're exploiting natural resources, they're planting things, and they're making a lot of money off of Hawaii. Meanwhile, Hawaii's economy is suffering. And so uh, the queen tries her best to limit whatever white plant or authority exists in Hawaii. Um, and of course, the whites themselves don't like it. So they're gonna go out of their way to uh, depose the queen and overthrow the government with the aid of the U.S. Marines. All right, so this is just a, uh, uh, again, it's it's the 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 imperialist urge by the United States to suppress uh, a local area and to you know absorb it somehow. Um, and five years after that, William McKinley ends up annexing Hawaii um, as a as a state. Okay, so this is when we finally get Hawaii as part of the United States, but again through um, less than scrupulous means. Okay, and and many individuals in the United States even oppose the United States trying to engage in this form of imperialism. Um, individuals like Grover Cleveland, for example, uh, actively campaign against the United States being involved in something like this because it comes across as um, ethnic, ethically unsound. Okay? Um, and of course the Hawaiian natives don't like it either. Right? They don't want to be part of some other country. Right? They want to be independent. Okay? So this is where we end up with uh, Hawaii as a, as a state. At the same time, too, we, we have uh, rumblings that the United States are, is n uh, not directly involved with in terms of a, a foreign conflict, uh, specifically as it relates to Cuba. Okay? And Cuba is you know, just basically about 100 miles off of the, uh, the Florida coast, okay? so it's, it's within close proximity to the United States, and any conflict that happens in Cuba is bound to eventually uh, spill over into the United States if, if, it, if it grows uh, to a certain proportion. And in the late 19th century, the, the native Cubans are, are already in rebellion against Spanish rule. And, and Spain has had control of Cuba at this point for a couple of hundred years, right? And the, um, the Cubans are, are very dissatisfied with what Spain is doing, right? Spain is already engaging in imperialism in and of itself. It's suppressing a lot of uh, local culture. Uh, it's, it's causing people to, um, you know, practice a certain religion, speak a certain language you know, wear certain clothing and so forth, practice certain customs, right? And so this is the uh, one of the early uh, attempts that we see of a, a native um, uh, or a nationalist response to an imperialist presence, okay? And nationalism ends up being the uh, ends up being the form of response that we see, especially a lot during World War One and thereafter, um, in response to imperialism. Okay, it's it's the foil supposedly to imperialism. And Cuba at this point, our, America's main interest in it is for uh, investment purposes, right? We've got sugar plantations there. There are, are mining practices that are taking place there, all of which benefit the American economy. Okay, so if 
we lose that particular uh, investment somehow, then part of America's economy suffers. So we have uh, a vested interest here. And there is a Cuban War for Independence that does occur between 1895 and 98, um, and um, Spain ends up basically crushing the the Cubans in the in the course of all this. Okay, the Cubans uh, lose tens of thousands of of peasants living on the Cuban island uh, to this to this particular conflict. Right, Spain is very brutal in its um, suppression of this. And this particular conflict is actually reported very widely in the United States by the New York Journal and the New York World, uh, William Randolph Hearst uh, being the, the leader of the former, and Joseph Pulitzer, who, for whom the Pulitzer Prize is named uh, in the latter. And Hearst in particular is accused of practicing what's called yellow journalism. Okay? And yellow journalism is something that we see even today in, in the 21st century in the United States. It's basically where you're taking, uh, and in a certain regard, you might refer to it as fake news these days. Right? It's the it's the same basic avenue of, of reporting information where you're trying to take a particular event, perhaps spin it a certain way or blow it in a uh, out of proportion to a certain way to make it more sensational and to garner more divided public opinion about it. Okay, and so when William Randolph Hearst begins to uh, send reporters to uh, to Cuba to report about this, in some cases they make up stories entirely uh, and try to basically get you know the United States uh, public to believe one way or another about what's going on to just manipulate public interest. And so initially, America's whole response to this is to pledge neutrality in this particular conflict, say that we have you know, invested interest in all this, but we don't want to get involved directly with the conflict if we can keep from it. Okay. Um, the turning point, though, comes in 1896 because Congress comes out in favor of the Cuban rebel cause. Okay, And the, the rebel cause, uh, anytime that a a foreign power in particular, we'll, we'll put it this way, if the United States recognizes a rebel cause in another country, it delegitimizes um, the, the official government on the world stage. Okay? And we, we see this being a common thing that happens throughout the 20th century uh, with regards to you know, nations like China or the Soviet Union or, or places like that. Anytime that a, a minority government is recognized, it grants it more legitimacy, okay? and it ends up with further division in this particular conflict. So when the U.S. government recognizes the Cuban rebel cause, it's basically saying that the Spanish government is illegitimate. Okay? Uh, and the Spanish try to offer the Cubans uh, some sort of autonomy without any kind of independence, which is kind of along the same lines as what Great Britain tried to do with the United States during the American Revolution. Okay? And the Cubans are already looking at the United States as being kind of this role model for um, for, for the way that they're going to model their own movement of independence. Okay? And so they, they're looking for the United States to eventually support their cause. And so when the U.S. decides that it's going to send um, a, a little bit of a, a supportive presence to Cuba, they send the USS Maine. Okay? It's a, a warship that docks in Havana Harbor on just a courtesy call. Right, There's not a... Um, there, there's not any... Uh, there's not a threat necessarily with it being there. Okay. Um, a few days later, the Spanish ambassador, a guy named Enrique Dupuy de Lome, sends a letter to William McKinley, uh, which is now infamously known as the de Lome letter. And uh, de Lome basically calls McKinley a weak people pleaser. Basically says, you know, you're trying too hard to play both ends from the middle. You're not committing to the conflict. You're not choosing a side. You're, you're a coward, basically. Okay. And so, you know, them's fighting words, essentially, <laughs> right? So he's, he's basically accusing McKinley of all these things, kind of trying to ramp up the United States, get it involved uh, in, in, uh, in the conflict. Things really come to a head, though, uh, less than a week later because uh, just overnight the USS Maine explodes in Havana Harbor, and you can see the wreckage here in the background. Um, and uh, the, the destruction ends up killing 260 American sailors. Okay? Now, with all of the, the events that, are, that lead up to this, okay, especially with the DeLome letter, with Spain's kind of you know, poking the bear, so to speak here, um, 
everything and, and all the yellow journalism and all the, the public sentiment towards Spain at this point is basically leading the American public to look at this and say that Spain blew up this ship. Okay, and that it, this is Spain's direct act of aggression and act of war to get us involved. Um, and of course, this sentiment that the United States public is getting involved in here is something called jingoism. It, it's a it's a, a warmongering, right? This this desire to get into a fight with somebody just for the sake of doing it. Okay, um, and also in in perhaps a more uh, subliminal or marginal sense, there is a large anti-Catholic sentiment in the United States as well. Okay, and again, part of this is due to the, the nativism of the time, right? A, a pushback against immigrants, many who are coming from Central Europe and Northern Europe, some of whom are Catholic, um, just a, a different culture from the, the predominantly Protestant culture of the United States at this point. And so, you know, if, uh, if this is certainly something that probably played a, a large role in this, uh, or at least some sort of role. And so again, the United States is trying to, um, you know, the, the government itself is trying to prevent people from getting involved in the war, but the people are, are ramping up support for a war, and especially now that this has happened. And to make matters worse, after the fact, several, you know, decades and uh, over a century now later, it's been determined that the, the explosion aboard the Maine was an accident, that this was not something that was an act of war by anybody. Um, the, uh, the, the general consensus, uh, after, you know, six different separate investigations uh, since 1898 has determined essentially that the boiler exploded in an accident and, and that that's what sank the ship. Um, Cuba, even up until the present day, uh, especially after um, Fidel Castro and other leaders have uh, taken control of Cuba, um, Cuba has basically insinuated that the U.S. blew up its own ship and killed its own sailors to get us involved in a war with Cuba. Okay, so take from this what you will, but most of the, um, the, the forensic archaeology that's been done on the wreckage of the Maine has basically indicated that that's what happened, that it was simply an accident. Uh, and of course, this if it is an accident, it comes at the worst possible time, right? Because it uh, it's kind of the um, to not to pull a pun or anything here, but it's the powder keg that explodes and, and causes us to get involved in the war. After this happens, uh, individuals like uh, Teddy Roosevelt immediately start calling for Congress to ramp up spending, uh, and Congress does. It authorizes fifty million dollars to prepare for an inevitable war with Spain. Now, and William McKinley is doing everything he can to negotiate to try to figure out exactly what happened. But finally, he relents and says to Congress, "We need to use military." Um, ships and so forth to blockade ports in Cuba to try to prevent them from sending ships to the United States to attack us. Right? And the Spanish take that as an act of war and they declare war on the United States on April 24th of 1898. And by April 25th, Congress turns around and does the exact same thing. It declares war on Spain um, and to kind of, you know, Put the point on the end of the sentence, what the U.S. does is it introduces something called the Teller Amendment, basically saying that we are not going to annex Cuba, that's not our intention, it's to simply stop this particular conflict from, from continuing. So when William McKinley and Teddy Roosevelt uh, see the United States go to war with Spain and Cuba, they realize that this could be potentially an opportunity for the U.S. to actually gain something out of this. Okay, so the um, and that's part of the imperialist mindset in general is to seek some sort of uh, gain in whatever conflict can come about here, right? Some new investment of some kind, right? So. Whether it's uh, territory, which in this case is what we're looking at, or if it's some sort of economic opportunity, um, typically though the two go hand in hand. Okay, so somehow we're going to try to get something out of this. First thing that Roosevelt does is he gets Commodore George Dewey to uh, take the U.S. naval fleet to the Philippines. Okay, which seems like it comes out of left field, but strategically it makes a little bit of sense. Okay. Um, the Philippines, of course, are located in the South Pacific, uh, not too far away from Guam, uh, and uh, also uh, not too far from uh, the uh, the Samoan Islands and, of course, Hawaii and all that kind of stuff. So um, basically, if you um, looking at the Philippines, you could send, essentially hopscotch from the, the Far East across the South Pacific to get to the United States. 
And so what Roosevelt is anticipating is that if you know, one, now that we are at war with Spain, all Spain has to do is send its fleet from the Philippines across the South Pacific and attack the U.S. West Coast. Okay, so in anticipation, what he does is he sends Dewey across, and Dewey lands at Manila and absolutely annihilates the Spanish fleet, um, just in a matter of uh, minutes and even maybe an hour or two. Okay. Um, and the U.S. naval forces at this point, uh, they all have steel-clad warships, okay? And this is still before the official moniker battleship is actually used, but this is uh, um, in, in everything but, uh, but name, this is what we have, okay? We have steel-clad warships with large guns that are armor-piercing. And the Spanish at this point still are working with ironclad ships and perhaps in some cases even with wooden ships still. Uh, so they're, they're not nearly as uh, advanced as what the U.S. forces are. So when the U.S. forces arrive, they literally just surround the Spanish fleet and bombard them with fire until all their ships have been destroyed. Okay? And over 400 Spanish sailors end up dying in the process. And in the aftermath of this, while this is still going on, um, the British and the Germans, who again have kind of this joint protectorate with some of the islands uh, in the area, they've all gathered around offshore to watch this happen, and they realize that the United States has much more firepower and much um, higher technology than even they do in some cases. And so this is very much uh, a moment where they go, okay, we need to go home and we need to start ramping things up immediately. Um, because now the U.S. poses a reasonable threat to just about everybody else in the world, right? We've, we've surpassed most people's expectations in terms of what we're able to accomplish. Um, and this is part of what causes Great Britain and Germany to engage in this, um, uh, you know, series of technological advances in this arms race that we get leading up to World War I. Emilio Aguinaldo, who is the leader of the Filipino resistance, uh, ends up uh, siding with George Dewey here, and they end up uh, obtaining the surrender of the Spanish on August 13th. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, back in late June, uh, we end up with the actual Cuban campaign beginning. Okay, The Americans finally start landing ground troops in Cuba. And the U.S. Army is very small at this point. It's got a standing force of about 28,000 soldiers, um, which is, uh, again, not nearly as many as, as is probably needed for something like this. Um, but we end up with over a million volunteers, uh, including about 10,000 African Americans, most of whom come from the northeast part of the country, um, to, to enlist in all this. And the the thing about the uh, why there's a a need to point out the demographic of African Americans in this case is some scholars have looked at this and stated that this is still um, a, a societal need for for African Americans to try to prove themselves still to a, a large portion of the country that they are that they're citizens that they have a vested interest in the United States and that they're willing to go to war to protect it. Okay, so it's a it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's almost like a, you know, proving one's worth in this case. The 1st Volunteer Cavalry, of course, is one of the most famous uh, in this particular conflict, right? They're known as the Rough Riders. Um, 578 volunteers on horseback. And Teddy Roosevelt, even though he is typically the, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, the face of the Rough Riders, if you like, his... His little group all, you know, dressed the same. They got the, the hats kind of cocked sideways with a little flap sticking up onto the, the brim of the hat. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's pretty misleading because Teddy Roosevelt actually was not the leader of the Rough Riders, number one. He was only second in command. Um, and Roosevelt himself actually resigned his commission as uh, Secretary of the Navy to go and join the Army because he wanted uh, prestige. He wanted to uh, prove himself as a war hero and, and get a lot of support from the public for that. So, um, so he's actually completely resigned from the government at this point and is actually just fighting as a grunt, essentially. So when he gets on the ground uh, and is actually, you know, joins up with the Rough Riders and everything, the common um, narrative is he leads the charge up San Juan Hill against you know Spanish firepower up on top of it and all this kind of stuff. In reality, Teddy Roosevelt did not lead the charge. He was not uh, he was not in command at that point. 
And he actually, um, by some accounts, he actually fell off his horse before they could even charge up the hill. So the charge went up the hill without Teddy Roosevelt while he's sitting on his butt in the dirt. <laughs> so um, very, very misleading and very different narrative from what we all know. Um, and the reality of the conflict itself is much, much worse than what people try to romanticize it as being. Uh, and people still have a very skewed idea of what they think war is like at this point. I mean, we still even have, uh, you know, at this point in time anyway, a, a generation of people who have been born after the Civil War. They've never actually seen this kind of conflict before. Um, and uh, and there's all kinds of logistical problems here, too. I mean, when the uh, when the U.S. forces land in Cuba, they land in one part of the island, and their horses and their gear and everything land in a completely different part of the island, right? They're, they're blown off course for one reason or another, so there's all kinds of confusion. Um, the uniforms that the soldiers are wearing are left over from the Civil War, so they're heavy wool. And this is a tropical environment, right? It's a subtropical environment. There, are, There's jungle, there are mosquitoes, there's malaria. Um, and, uh, I mean, fighting in jungle warfare is something that the U.S. forces have not really engaged in at any real point in time yet. Uh, I mean, the furthest south that U.S. forces have gotten is Mexico during the Mexican-American War. So this is, uh, this is a very different type of heat than a desert heat, right? We're fighting in the, uh, in the jungles of Cuba now. Again, the, the malaria, the, the typhoid, all that kind of stuff just wreaks absolute havoc, dysentery, you name it. Uh, so the climate is horrible, the, the carnage, and the confusion of jungle warfare in general. Um, when we get to World War II, we talk a little bit more about this as well. Um, just the confusion of fighting in the jungle because it's so easy to get lost and to get turned around. And, uh, and especially if you have individuals who are hiding in the jungle who are attacking you, um, it creates a lot of psychological warfare as well. By July of 1898, the Spanish Navy is completely trapped and destroyed in Santiago Harbor. I mean, you can see it down here near the bottom. Um, and uh, at that particular case, again, we get about another 474 Spaniards who were killed right along the same lines as what happened in Manila. And by July, uh, July 17th, that is, the Spanish finally end up surrendering Santiago. Okay, They, they realize that this is, um, there, there's too much... Um, too much firepower that the U.S. has, more so than they anticipated. Okay? Um, and Americans end up moving into Puerto Rico not too long thereafter. Uh, there's not a whole lot of resistance uh, with them doing this because the Spanish have um, kind of started to tuck tail and run. And by August 12th, there's a, a full ceasefire that's negotiated uh, but among the Philippines and in, um, and in Cuba as well. Uh, and ironically, what happens here is even though the Americans have essentially come to the aid of the native Cubans themselves, the, the Cubans are completely excluded from the, um, from the ceasefire ceremony. Okay? They, they're actually pushed completely out of everything, and the U.S. forces are the one that uh, end up taking control of the situation. Uh, in December, the U.S. and Spain finally seal the deal by signing the Treaty of Paris, and this is one of many treaties of Paris that the U.S. ends up signing over the course of history, but um, this one in particular ends the, uh, the Spanish-American War. Grants Cuban independence, uh, okay, we end up annexing Puerto Rico, and we temporarily occupy Manila, uh, pending the transfer of power over to the Filipinos, okay. And this, uh, this temporary occupation of Manila is something that becomes a, a bigger problem later on, something that um, the U.S. is actually not willing to concede as quickly as it should have. And, of course, there's tons and tons of casualties with this. Like I said, this is a completely different uh, type of war than the U.S. has ever attempted to fight. Um, uh, and this is, uh, it says more than 60, it should be more than 60,000 Spanish soldiers uh, and sailors who died from their wounds and disease. Uh, and there's actually more people who are killed from disease than there are from, um, from the actual fighting itself. Okay? From, again, typhoid, malaria, and dysentery in particular, all of which are uh, you know, mosquito-borne diseases and that kind of thing. Um, about 10,500 cub Cubans have been killed in the process. And of the nearly 5,500 Americans who were killed in this particular conflict, only 379 of them die in battle. The rest, right, this other 5,000 or so, all die of disease or, you know, overheating or 
uh, or, or something like that, right? Heat stroke, you name it, right? It's all environmental factors that end up doing most of the killing. And the U.S. ambassador to Great Britain, a guy named John Hay, uh, is the one who gets a reputation at the end of the war uh, because of his little remark. He says that this conflict is a, quote, splendid little war, right? Again, it's something that doesn't last very long, right? It, it conforms to the strangely stereotypical idea that wars are quick affairs for some reason during this period, and the U.S. comes out it with all these big gains uh, at the end. And of course, the Spaniards have a completely different idea of this. They view it as the disaster, okay? Because this ends up completely destroying Spain's um, nearly 400-year uh, reign of influence in the Western Hemisphere. Um, Spain actually packs up and leaves the Western Hemisphere almost entirely after this. So um, Spain gradually goes into very, very heavy decline as a world power uh, and never really quite recovers. Uh, even all into the 20th century, it never quite fully bounces back. Again, the next big problem that we face is the Philippines, because now that America is in occupation of Manila, right, we're, we're at this point where we feel so obnoxiously full of pride after the Spanish defeat that there is this, um, you know, really, we've really puffed out our chests as a nation, right? We're parading ourselves around. Um, Teddy Roosevelt even goes so far as to take the American fleet, the, the ships, and have them all painted white, okay? And when he does this, he sends this white fleet, is what it's nicknamed, sends the White Fleet on a worldwide parade tour is basically what it is, where these ships basically sail to every major port in the world to show off uh, these brand new steel-clad warships that we have. And it's a, it's a show of force, it's kind of an intimidation tactic, um, and it's also a little bit of a defensive tactic, strategic defensive tactic too, because he's really doing a survey of where all the major ports are, what the defenses look like, um, you know, who controls what, so it's, uh, it's really kind of to keep an eye on everything else and to see where other potential threats might come from, and are there territories that the U.S. can gain from those particular areas too, okay, so it's a, it's a, it's kind of a brash way of doing things, right, just basically, it's like invading someone's house to look at all the goodies that they have laying around to see if anything is worth stealing. <laughs> And of course, there's tons of uh, elements of justification that are that are trounced during this period, right? Manifest destiny, of course, is still one that people are harping about, um, and Anglo-Saxon racial superiority, unfortunately, is still something that people are not really looking at with a side glance, right? People are still thinking that this is a somehow an okay thing, right? We're still uh, a couple of decades away from Nazi Germany rising, so this is not. Uh, um, this has not yet become a, a major issue for the, the general public just yet. And the political status of the Philippines uh, is still, again, because we occupy Manila, it's not been resolved yet. Okay, We, we still haven't decided exactly what to do with it. Um, we have promised, ostensibly, that we're going to return it back to Filipino rule, but we're, uh, we're hanging on to it again just a little bit too long. Um, and the U.S. businessmen, again, who have been in power, who have been associated with the Republican presidents up until now, are very, very eager to hang on to the Philippines because they believe that, again, with this idea of these island chains being kind of like, uh, like a stepping stone path to China in particular, um, that this is going to open up a lot of markets for the U.S. and make people a lot of money. Okay? So, of course, just like we have seen before, right, money tends to kind of be at the root of all this. And at the same time, too, there's all kinds of other vested interests. There are American missionaries who begin to uh, try to incorporate uh, Christian evangelism into this practice. Uh, and by now, of course, uh, the Philippines are predominantly Roman Catholic. Again, they were colonized by Spain a long time ago. That's why they're named the Philippines after King Philip of, of Spain. Um, and uh, Roman Catholicism is the primary religion at that point. Spanish is the primary language. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, was it uh, Tagalog, I think, is the other uh, kind of pidgin language, Creole language that uh, comes out in the Philippines as well. Um, but the official religion is now changed over to, um, uh, to Protestantism, Protestant Christianity, and English is made the quote-unquote official language now. So we've we have done, again, we've done the imperial thing. We've come in, we have taken over a country, we've suppressed local culture, and we're trying to replace it with something else. 
Okay, so all very, very characteristic of imperialism. And William McKinley, again, who was very, very reluctant for us to get involved in this in the first place, is now touting all kinds of justifications for why we need to uh, annex the Philippines. Okay, he says, for one, national glory, because now we have won a major conflict, our first major foreign conflict. It'll open us up to commerce like we already established with China. Again, the whole racial superiority thing is still not something that people uh, are, are looking at as, as an offensive thing. Again, there are certain groups who are looking at it that way, but by and large, the public is, uh, is not ready to completely disavow this just yet. Okay? And again, it's not necessarily until Nazi Germany comes along and shows just how horrible this particular uh, mindset uh, can become before people actually begin to change their minds. And, uh, of course, Christian evangelism, right? So all these things added together, uh, again, they all end up adding up to, uh, uh, to again, classic imperialism. Uh, and each one of these is a feature of an imperialist country at some point. And so American negotiators uh, end up coming out with a deal where they offer Spain $20 million for the Philippines, for Puerto Rico, and for Guam. Okay, so if you look here on this map, all of the pink regions that we see here are all, including these little boxes out in the Philippines, are all added to U.S. territories by the time we get to the end of this particular time period. Uh, again, we, we acquire Alaska from Russia uh, in, in 1867, although it doesn't actually become a state until, I think, 1950. Uh, but Wake Island, Howland Island, uh, the Samoan Islands... Uh, Hawaii, Guam, the Philippines, all of these little pink boxes down here in the South Pacific all become U.S. territories. Hawaii is annexed in 1898. Wake Island is claimed by the United States. And so, like I said, now we have this, uh, you know, proverbial little, uh, you know, stepping stone path from the U.S. all the way over to China. And this is going to make people a lot, a lot of money uh, if it's allowed to continue. Um, and Germany and the United States agree to divide the Samoan Islands in 1899, so Germany uh, has already got its hands into uh, places like Africa and, and other, uh, you know, other places in the Eastern Hemisphere at this point as well. We haven't gotten that far yet, though. So now we take the conflict and turn it back over to where we are now directly in conflict with the people that we helped out in the first place. Okay. Uh, for one thing, Congress is not too pleased with the Treaty of Paris. Okay? They realize that this is actually quite a bit of imperialist ideology that has gone into this. Uh, we have ended up subjecting a lot of people to things that we uh, agreed not to. Okay? Um, and of course, there's a lot of people in the United States who are very anti-expansionist as well. They don't think that America is really practicing what it preaches here. Right? The idea that America is the one who has, you know, kind of been a shining example to a lot of the world at this point by saying that we need to, you know, promote self-governance, you know, and, and self-sovereignty and all that kind of stuff. And yet here we are doing the same thing that Great Britain did to the United States. We're suppressing another country who's in a fledgling state. And William Jennings Bryan, remember, who we talked about from, um, you know, from Chapter 19 as being an individual who kind of takes the Democratic Party and begins to turn it more to kind of the social justice mindset uh, and, and so forth. He starts to convince Congress that if we can ratify the Treaty of Paris, then eventually, right, again, eventually, kind of this, you know, parenthetical word here, that eventually the Filipinos will gain independence over time, right? That somehow we're going to act as some kind of protectorate for a time until, you know, its government stabilizes and all this kind of stuff, and then we will return it to their control, right? As if we're being uh, some kind of benevolent parent here. And the common phrase uh, at this point in time, too, is we do not want the Filipinos, we want the Philippines. Okay? So the, the United States, unfortunately, we've gotten such a big head about all this and about how we can actually exploit um, the, uh, the natural resources of the Philippines and all this that we uh, start completely uh, overlooking the people themselves right? and what they are actually experiencing. Right? We're, we're so willing to, to shove them out of the way to get to what we need that, um, that you know, human rights tend to um, go out the window. And again, this idea of benevolent assimilation is something that the U.S. has practiced in one regard or another, right? We, we've practiced this with Native Americans. We've practiced it 
uh, w with slavery. We've we've done it time and time again, and um, and yet here we are doing it all over again. So benevolent uh, anything. Anytime you see the word benevolent put in there, it's it's done in a way that is uh, completely demeaning. In a way that is actually um, rather than just physically attacking someone, it's telling them that we're attacking you, but we're doing you a favor by doing it. Okay, so it's it's very. Um, Patronizing, I don't think even fully covers it, right? It, but it's uh, it's extremely dehumanizing. That's the best way I can put it. And Emilio Aguinaldo, who we worked with up until this point, who has helped George Dewey uh, gain control of the Philippines, uh, is named the the president of the Philippines after he declares independence. He actually comes out and specifically tells the United States, "We are going to be independent now," and the U.S. basically says, "No, you're not." Okay. And so um, we get into all these little minor pitched battles between uh, the insurrectos, which are under Aguinaldo, right? That's the name for his um, guerrilla warriors. And they end up uh, getting into these little guerrilla warfare tactics with the U.S. military to the point where the Philippine Republic that Aguinaldo has just declared the independence of turns around and declares war on the United States because we are, uh, over the course of six months here, we're not willing to give it up. Okay, so... Um, the, this is another, you know, very controversial thing, right? The United States, uh, if it had given it up sooner, would the Philippines have? Would we have gotten into this conflict or not? Who can say? Um, but again, just like a, you know, we talked about at the beginning, right? This idea of imperialism uh, overextending its reach, it ends up breeding a nationalist response. Okay. And uh, in this case, the nationalism of the Philippines is, or the Filipinos, is what ends up coming back and biting the United States in the butt. Okay, so when we have a, a an imperialist nation that has suppressed a culture or the or laws or way of life or whatever of another culture, then that culture tends to build up nationalism, right? A sense of national pride, perhaps of ethnic pride, cultural pride of some kind, and it ends up, um, you know, gathering a uh, a united response to fight back against imperialism. So it happens time and time and time again. And we end up with nearly a quarter of a million Filipino casualties, most of whom are civilians in this particular conflict. Um, the insurrectos themselves actually make up a relatively minor proportion compared to uh, the civilians who get caught in the middle. A okay. um, little over 4,000 American casualties. Uh, and again, just like what we see with uh, with Cuba, this is another tropical climate. Again, and the Philippines are an area that we revisit during World War II. Okay, specifically, this is where we end up um, with the United States fighting the Japanese in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, and of course, again, it's a it's a jungle climate, right? There are uh, it's, it's subtropical. There are uh, mosquitoes-borne diseases, uh, massacres, confusion, psychological warfare. Um, and uh, and torture gets brought into it in the mix here as well. Uh, of course, if you uh, have heard of waterboarding, right? This became a, a popular term in the United States beginning about 20 years ago. Unfortunately, uh, they started calling it the water cure back then. And that's when it kind of starts. And then um, garroting or garroting, however you want to say it, uh, is, a, is another practice that's used. Um, the device that you see over here on the right in this picture is something called a garrot or garrot, however you, again, however you want to pronounce it. But basically what it is is the individual who is going to be tortured is sat down in this seat here. Their back is put up against the post, and then this little iron collar here is wrapped around their neck and latched on the other side of the pole where the person can't get away. Then their hands are usually bound behind the pole. And this little rod that you see here hanging down in the back is actually a crank. Okay, And this crank is twisted constantly until a bolt, uh, a metal bolt, actually comes in uh, on the back of this collar through the post and into the back of the person's neck to where it's literally uh, strangling them. Okay. And it was, uh, again, it's an interrogation tactic, right, to try to torture somebody into giving information. And if they don't, if the crank is turned long enough and hard enough, you will break a person's neck doing it. So, um, unfortunately, the United States was not above using torture at this point. Um, and again, this is extremely ironic and extremely tragic because America has now completely suppressed an entire movement that was originally modeled after its own move toward independence. Right? The Filipinos looked at the United States as a role model 
and now the role models have turned around and have completely smashed them in the way that Great Britain did us. So it's a, again, really, really tragic uh, end to this particular conflict. And it's not like everybody in the United States is actually in support of this conflict either. Um, there is an actual American anti-imperialist league that is founded in the United States in 1899. Um, and individuals like Andrew Carnegie join it. And Carnegie actually even attempts to purchase the Filipinos' independence from the United States. Uh, he comes out and actually offers the U.S. government $20 million, which is what we paid to get all of the territories that we acquired at the end of the war. He offers them that amount from his own pocket to purchase the Philippines and allow them to have independence, and the U.S. government says no anyway. And other individuals like Samuel Gompers, who we saw from uh, Chapter 17, right? He was a, a big union leader, and Jane Addams, of course, the, the the first female Nobel Prize winner, are among the members of this, right? And uh, there's plenty of politicians too, Grover Cleveland, um, you know, other individuals like that who are absolutely against the United States expanding. Uh, even Mark Twain has something to say about it at some point. And so even Benjamin Harrison, too, right, one of the other former U.S. presidents. Basically, they all say, you know, we need to get out of here. We don't need to stay in the Philippines. We don't need to do this to these people because it's setting a bad example and a bad precedent. Instead, the imperialists end up winning the argument, and we end up completely changing the face of the Philippines as a result. Uh, in 1901, William Howard Taft is made the civil governor of the Philippines. So now we no longer have martial law. We no longer have a military government uh, installed in the Philippines. Now we actually have it as a U.S. territory, much in the same way that Guam is today, or um, uh, Puerto Rico, for example. And the Philippine Government Act comes in and says that the, that the island chain is an unorganized territory, right? that we are going to actually keep control of it for a while. Um, and the Filipino independence that we promised them is not even granted until after the end of World War II, not until 1946. Um, so this is a very, very long time and a, a, a point where the United States really has essentially overstepped its bounds. 1900, the Foraker Act comes in and establishes a U.S.-sponsored government on Puerto Rico. Okay, and Puerto Rico, again, serves as a, a, an outpost for the United States. But the civilians in, in Puerto Rico are not actually granted U.S. citizenship until 1917, okay? And it's still, you know, constantly overlooked even today that, um, that Puerto Rico is actually technically a, a part of the United States, right? That it is still um, a U.S. territory. Um, and we finally end up granting independence to Cuba, right? But it, uh, again, just like we do with the Philippines and Puerto Rico, we take our sweet time in doing it, right? We say that we're going to restore order and organize a bunch of schools, try to improve sanitary conditions, but we end up finally giving that over uh, quicker than the others. Um, and in the aftermath of all these conflicts that have involved jungle warfare, especially and the, the climate and all the disease, um, we get the advent of Dr. Walter Reed, who is actually um, given the, uh, the charge of the Army Yellow Fever Commission in 1900 after he proves that mosquitoes are the ones carrying uh, all the diseases that have totally decimated the U.S. forces uh, and um, you know, managing to control outbreaks and give inoculations and that kind of thing. So um, this is why we have Walter Reed uh, Hospital here in the United States. It's named for him. Um, by 1900, the, U the Cubans draft a U.S.-inspired constitution, again, kind of like what uh, the, the Filipinos attempted to do and were prevented from. And in 1901, um, the U.S. introduces the Platt Amendment, and this requires Cuba to fulfill several promises in order to be granted um, independence. For one, we, uh, we tell them that they never are going to be able to sign a treaty with a third power of any kind. Okay? And this, this is really extremely limiting, uh, especially in, in the modern sense. And of course, Cuba has long since um, you know, gone in a different direction from this. Um, it has to keep its debt within the government's power to repay it. In other words, it can't overextend itself. And if it does, the United States basically says, we're not going to come to your rescue. And it has to acknowledge that the U.S. Uh, has the ability and the authority to intervene whenever it sees fit. So basically, Cuba has to live with, under the United States' thumb uh, in, in many regards. 
Um, and finally, it has to be able to sell and lease land to the United States to use as coaling mines or as naval stations, right? And this is what leads to the construction of the now infamous Guantanamo Bay. Okay? Uh, Guantanamo Bay, of course, um, gained a, a really foul reputation uh, at the beginning of the 21st century for being a, uh, a haven for um, prisoner torture, right? Torture of prisoners of war in particular. And now when it comes to Asia, now that we have gotten to the doorstep uh, to China in particular, um, China is already in a position where it is being divvied up by several European imperialist powers. Um, and as you can see here from the map, it is, it's divvied up uh, quite a bit, right? These different colors here each represent um, different spheres of influence, as the little legend here says. Um, uh, the large portion of what is controlled up here in the north is controlled by Russia, right up here in Mongolia and Manchuria. Okay, um, all the green sections here are controlled by the British. All the yellow by the French. The purple here in the little corner is the Japanese, and this small little area here, just south of Beijing, by the Yellow Sea, is controlled by the Germans. Okay, um, and Japan actually manages to come in when China is at a, a weakened state and ends up defeating it in what's called the First Sino-Japanese War. Um, and by 1900, because we have all these different European powers who are trying to act as opportunists in the aftermath of that, we have a large, um, almost evenly divided uh, territorial um, uh, division of China. So, uh, and all these areas too, now that these European powers have come in, they've agreed that they are going to exercise influence over certain areas, but they're not going to try to officially annex any territory. In other words, they're not going to say, well, this is part of Great Britain or this is part of Russia or anything like that now. Okay? There's enough um, still of these natural divisions, especially up here with uh, Mongolia, Manchuria, and Russia to prevent that from actually happening. Um, and the, the British actually encouraged the United States, now that they have won these two, um, these two conflicts, to come in and actually basically saying the water's fine, come on in. And the United States actually rejects it and says that we're not going to um, try to take any joint action with them. And the Secretary of State, John Hay, who we've already introduced, the splendid little war guy, he introduces what he calls an open door policy concerning China. And he basically says that China should remain open to all European and American trade without being controlled by any singular one. And this is a difficult deal to, to get everybody on board with because, again, there's so much uh, influence that's spread around by everybody that if everybody – uh, that if not everybody agrees to this, it can lead to another conflict. Okay, so it's uh, – and we've got you know five or six different countries now who are all wanting a piece of this. Um, but it keeps the market available, if nothing else. Okay, and um, even though imperialist influence does actually come over to China quite a bit, and China has already gained a, a negative reputation uh, in the United States at this point, right? We've already introduced the Chinese Exclusion Act to prevent people from actually migrating from China. Um, most of the the negative stereotypes associated with China have been perpetuated by individuals like the British. Okay? The, the opium trade and the opium dens and all that kind of stuff. Most of that is um, due to British imperialism than anything else. Um, and of course, the Japanese are primarily concerned because the Russians seem to have the largest slice. Okay, this large orange portion up here at the top again seems to indicate that the Russians are the ones who are going to gain the most control over China. And if the other individuals end up backing off, then Russia might be able to gain control of that as well. Okay, so the Japanese end up expanding um, their territory and they start expanding expanding their technology and their military quite a bit in response. Okay. Um, and this is actually kind of the beginning of uh, Japan expanding its influence leading up to World War II as well. Okay, so we're, they're still kind of in the fledgling stages um, at this point as well. They've been kind of a – they've been a British protectorate for a long time, and the British have actually been uh, one of the ones the, – the primary country who has kind of sponsored their, their growth and development, uh, especially as it regards a navy. Okay, and so we'll start to see the after effects of that, especially after World War I leading into Japan's expansion into a larger empire during World War II. Um, 1900, we get the, uh, the Boxer Rebellion, or the Fists of Righteous Harmony, 
think that's a much better term. Um, and again, this is another nationalist response to an imperialist presence. Okay, um, the, the the Chinese nationalists, the the boxers, is what they're nicknamed. Okay, they end up rebelling against uh, all foreign involvement in China, uh, and they start attacking foreign embassies. Okay, so all the the, the British, the German, Russian, Japanese, and American uh, embassies are all under attack from the Boxer Rebellion. And uh, all the countries in question end up organizing a joint expedition to try to rescue what diplomats there are, just in case the nationalists do manage to gain control of China and kick everybody out. And uh, the Boxer Rebellion actually ends up ending uh, when this uh, military expedition, this joint expedition, ends up reaching um, what is modern-day Beijing, which used to be called Peking, over here, again, right around the, um, uh, the German territory by the Yellow Sea. Um, and after it ends, Hay comes in and refines the open door policy. He kind of basically says, we, we still don't want to take control of China. We don't want to divide it up. Um, trying to reassure the Chinese that there's no need for a nationalist response, even though there is still a pretty significant amount of imperialism that is at play here. And of course, the central figure in, in most of this, as all this is going on, is Theodore Roosevelt. Okay? Um, and Roosevelt has a, a very unique background. Uh, he's, uh, again, he's very much a product of his time in terms of what he uh, perceives himself as a, an American to be, what he perceives himself as a man to be, a male, that is. Um, for one thing, he is actually born into a, a very upper-class family. He's Harvard-educated. Um, second cousin eventually to uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who also becomes president. Um, and he is uh, something of a polymath. He's a very intelligent man. He's a, a very voracious reader, um, according to one account, and I'm not sure how accurate this is, but um, according to one account, he read one full book every single day while he was president. I, I don't know how he could fit that into his schedule, but um, he was uh, apparently extremely voracious in that. Of course, he's an intellectual. He's a writer. He wrote several books, um, known for being a, a natural scientist, a historian. And, uh, of course, as a president, he kind of started to pitch everything in a, in a moral light, right? So he tried to uh, basically came across as a, a, an expert or, at worst, a know-it-all and just about every area that you can think of. Um, and the one thing that comes to his particular advantage here is that even though he is a Republican, he absolutely hates the spoil system and is completely against political corruption. So he kind of is the, the fulfillment of the, the Republican ideal of the 19th century that we need to get rid of the spoil system and replace it with a merit system. Right? Roosevelt is really the only individual who, um, who ends up fulfilling this promise. Um, and he ends up losing both his mother and his wife uh, approximately 11 hours apart uh, in the same house, unfortunately. They both actually came down um, with, a, with, I believe it was a fever each one of them had. Uh, his, um, I think it was his mother was dying in an upstairs room, and uh, she died, and he came downstairs uh, just in time to watch his wife die as well. So it's extremely and really very traumatic for him because he ends up... Um, completely leaving society for the better part of two years to live in the Dakota Territory in a log cabin. Okay, um, total isolation, and this is where he gets um, such a reputation as a, as a hunter, as a game uh, game hunter, big game hunter, that kind of thing, um, being kind of a you know the the rough frontiersman and so forth. And then he finally, uh, after he you know goes through that phase of his life, he ends up returning back to the public sphere and enters into politics. Um, in 1886, he ends up remarrying, and he runs for mayor of New York City, even though he doesn't win. But he does serve as six years as a U.S. Civil Service Commissioner and uh, as the police commissioner for New York City for two years as well. Okay, so uh, uh, in a certain regard, you could look at him and think that maybe this is where the template for uh, Commissioner game James Gordon from the, the Batman <laughs> universe might have come from. Gotham is modeled after New York City anyway. Um, 1896, he actually campaigns for William McKinley, right? So we're kind of backtracking to where we were before, okay? Um, and McKinley uh, actually, in, in an indirect way and kind of ironically, ends up giving um, Roosevelt the assistant secretary of the Navy position, the, the position that leads him uh, right into the Spanish-American War, 
He ends up winning the New York governorship after he comes back from the war as, as a rough rider and all this kind of stuff, so he does gain quite a bit more of a reputation then. And by the 1900 campaign, now that um, McKinley is about to enter into a potential second term in office, imperialism becomes the biggest issue, right? All this stuff about whether America is justified in, um, you know, in suppressing foreign countries and taking over certain areas and, you know, being able to do these kinds of, um, you know, major treaties and so forth, is it justified in doing it? And William Jennings Bryan nominates, is nominated by the Democrats. He's the one who runs on the anti-imperialist platform. He says that uh, this is not something we need to continue doing. And Bryan, of course, tries to uh, pass it off as a moral issue. Okay? He says that uh, you know, we, we, we're not fulfilling our promises. We're hypocrites if we allow this to continue. And McKinley, of course, is renominated by the Republicans, and he chooses Roosevelt as his vice president. And McKinley and Roosevelt win the popular vote, 7.2 million to uh, Bryan, 6.4 million, and an overwhelming number uh, in the uh, Electoral College as well, 292 votes to 155. Okay. So it sounds like um, the, the imperialist ideology is going to be led into another uh, term in office for McKinley. Only a few months after he is uh, after he begins his second term, though, William McKinley is actually shot in the chest by uh, an anarchist named Leon Cholgaz. Uh, and uh, Cholgaz uh, is actually, um, uh, again, he en ends up completely bringing this entire train to a halt here. Okay? Now that this happens, though, McKinley is out of commission. He's still alive, okay? but he is, he's shot, he's out of commission, and now Roosevelt has to enter into the presidency. And it takes, um, takes a few more days, but McKinley finally uh, succumbs to his wounds and dies, becoming the third president that we have assassinated while in office. Um, and now Teddy Roosevelt has virtually an entire four-year term in front of him where he can um, uh, exercise all of his political influence, all of his uh, experience and so forth as president. And he's the youngest president that we have at this point. He's only 43 years old. Okay. Um, and he's the first quote-unquote activist president. He, he casts every issue in American politics and society in some kind of a moral and or patriotic light. Basically says that, you know, if we, if we go to war, it's because want, God wants us to go to war. If there's a problem with society, it's because um, sin or something else is coming into play and we need to uh, do something better. Um, and he's quoted as saying that he viewed the presidency as a quote, bully pulpit from which he could actually exercise all of this, um, all this thing. And he, he genuinely loved being president. He, he loved the attention, uh, he loved the influence, and he just loved to talk to people. The crown jewel of Teddy Roosevelt's presidency has to be the Panama Canal. Um, this is something, again, that is directly related to the U.S.'s pursuit of kind of this imperialist idea um, and something that facilitates, again, its, uh, its rise to prominence on the world stage. Okay? Um, like we said, the, the Panama Canal uh, is right here in Panama. Okay? This is kind of a close-up shot of this uh, little peninsula right, that connects uh, Central America with South America. Um, and you see here the canal zone is a, a small area that is um, just cut right through the center of the peninsula that allows ships to go from the Caribbean over into uh, the Gulf of Panama and eventually into the Pacific Ocean. And again, this particular location is uh, its essentially like an express lane, right? It, it allows people to uh, move their ships directly from one sea to the next, cutting down uh, essentially what is an 8,000-mile trip. Otherwise, you would have to go all the way around the southern tip of South America and come back up the other side. So this is extremely expedient, uh, considering the alternative. Um, and Panama had traditionally been used as an overland route for uh, the gold trade from California. Uh, California was at one point producing somewhere around uh, one-third, I think, of the entire uh, planet's gold supply uh, during the time. And so a lot of this gold was being transported from California down through Mexico into South America in many cases. Um, so this is a, a, a pretty popular uh, avenue of, of travel to begin with, and so for the U.S. to step in and kind of remake it um, as part of U.S. territory and everything um, didn't really go over so well with everyone. 
Um, the U.S. and Great Britain are the ones who end up partnering on this deal. They sign what's called the Clayton Bulwar Treaty in 1850. And this begins way before Teddy Roosevelt ever becomes president and way before the United States ever even gets involved in the Civil War. Okay, so this is a long, long drawn out um, uh, project. Okay. Um, beginning in 1881, uh, going all the way until 1887, uh, Ferdinand de Lesseps uh, is the uh, guy who is put in charge of the construction of the Panama Canal. He's actually the man who built the Suez Canal in Egypt. Uh, and this is a massive, massive project uh, for the time period. I mean, $300 million is allocated for this project. And back then, that's a, a, an insane amount of money. I mean, uh, in, in today's realm, it would have been somewhere around $3 billion, most likely, if not more than that. Um, and so, uh, and 20,000 people end up uh, dying in the process of building this thing, right? It's, it's, a, a, ma it's a disaster in many ways. Um, and it's no surprise that it takes it until 1914 before it's actually finished, okay? So it's, this is a very, very long process. And uh, when Lesap actually comes in and begins construction on this, uh, he only manages to finish one third of the canal. Okay, and uh, then the U.S. comes in and purchases what he has done and starts to kind of pick up from there and continue the project. Okay, uh, the Hay Ponsfort uh, uh, Ponsfort Treaty, I beg your pardon, results in uh, the United States getting uh, permission to build the canal to finish it. Okay, this happens in 1901, um, and uh, John Hay, right, the guy who is our um, uh, foreign minister, right, goes in and treats with uh, the ambassador for Colombia, Tomas Haran. Uh, he pays $10 million, and they agree to a six-mile wide canal zone in Panama. Okay, this is still only a fraction of what it ends up being in the long run, though. Uh, over time, the Panamanians actually are so fed up with the U.S. being involved in this uh, and uh, against uh, Colombia as well, because Colombia is directly uh, to the east, right? They are the ones who actually end up taking control of much of Panama, uh, in, in the beginning. So the Panamanians actually end up res, uh, revolting against the Colombians, and they elect a French engineer, uh, Philippe Bonavaria, uh, to be the ambassador to the U.S. Okay? And the canal zone is then extended to 10 miles wide. Okay? So this it gets gradually bigger over time, right? That we, we realize that we need more space for these ships. Um, U.S. pays a $10 million down payment, and we are required to pay a quarter of a million dollars each year um, in, in perpetuity. And so this allows us to gain perpetual control of what is now a 50-mile-long canal zone that is uh, 10 miles wide. Okay, so we have, it's, a, it's a large, large area. Um, and from that point forward, it takes uh, roughly 10 years for the, uh, for the canal to be finished. Uh, and 60,000 unskilled workers are utilized during this particular point, and roughly one-third of them end up dying. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, and for various reasons, right? Mostly from disease, although accidents, of course, are, are pretty common as well, right? Still from this particular time period, if you're an unskilled worker working in a, uh, you know, a, a dangerous construction environment like this, Obviously, there's not really any hard hats necessarily to speak of. You might have had one or two that are made of leather, uh, but nothing, uh, not really any major protection or, you know, uh, regulations of any kind to, to make sure people are safe. Uh, and the canal finally opens on August 15th, 1914. This is two weeks before World War I begins. Okay, so it's, uh, it comes at a pretty, uh, just right in the nick of time, really, because we end up using ships uh, during World War I. But um, again, it's, it's a, you know, kind of a last minute uh, completion. And the Latin Americans are not happy with this, really. Uh, they believe that Roosevelt has basically stolen the, the canal zone away from them. Uh, and, and really, it is a, a big sense of US imperialism, right? I mean, you see the political cartoon up here of Roosevelt as a giant coming in and basically digging his way directly through a, a uh, what is essentially a, a sovereign nation, right? And that's basically what it is, right? We go straight through a country and basically divide it in two. Uh, so this is a, um, you know, it's it's not something that's easily overlooked, right? We're we're not really conceding to to build any bridges or anything necessarily at this point to you know continue this overland trade route, right? We've we've interrupted commerce in a, a big way. Um, and thereafter, I mean, the United States and Europe constantly get in involved in Latin American affairs, and this leads to um, some bad blood between the U.S. and Latin America for a very long time, even all the way up until the, the middle part of the 20th century. Um, so there's still kind of this um, 
what am I looking for? A nationalist response that uh, that you know comes back and blows up in the face of the United States again as a reaction to imperialism. By 1902, Latin Americans start pre uh, to present what they call the Drago Doctrine, and this is their um, their attempt to try to push back against uh, you know the United States and European powers and so forth. They basically say that uh, they're not going to allow any armed intervention by any foreign countries when it comes to collecting debts. Right? They're basically saying you're acting like a an enforcer, like a mob enforcer or something, uh, and we're we're not going to tolerate that. Problem though is that they're not really in a um, a position to do that, right? They don't have the the power and the authority that a lot of these other countries do. Okay, and especially the United States now that it's starting to feel pretty full of itself, uh, starts to come across as the bully. By December, the British and the Germans uh, actually begin to blockade the Dominican Republic, and they do it uh, basically saying, "Look at how strong we are compared to you, right? This this Drago doctrine that you're bringing about is uh, is not something that's going to be valid, right? We're we're not going to." We're not going to sit by and let you try to make idle threats against us. Okay, so there's a lot of um, you know chest puffing and, and that kind of thing going on during this point. And Roosevelt actually takes the Monroe Doctrine, which been which has been in existence now for um, probably the better part of a hundred years. Right, we're getting pretty close to that. Right, um, I would say probably about seventy five years now. And uh, he issues something called the Roosevelt Corollary. Okay, so the Monroe Doctrine, if you recall from History thirteen oh one basically says that um, any efforts by the uh, by any European uh, power to try to interfere in the affairs of the Western Hemisphere is going to be considered a threat. Okay, and so the United States is going to respond if European powers try to invade in any way. And so Roosevelt is basically issuing this little um, addition to that, saying that the U.S. has the right just you know, by virtue of itself and no other reason, has the right to intervene in any Latin American affairs to prevent Europe from invading. Okay, so basically saying we have the right to get involved in other people's business, you know, but saying that we're doing so out of defense of these other people. Okay, so it's a, uh, it's just basically an excuse to, you know, uh, extend your authority over someone else. So again, just kind of a, another thinly veiled form of imperialism that obviously doesn't go over very well. Final bit we'll talk about here is the U.S. relations with Japan. Okay, and remember, Japan at this point is still kind of a, a gradually developing nation. Okay, it's just now gotten to the point where it's beginning to utilize, uh, you know, Western clothing, Western culture, um, and so forth. It's starting to use technology for the first time, and it's it's rapidly advancing. Okay, and Japan is not really one that's going to just um, you know take forever to to do that. It gets a lot of patronage from Great Britain. Um, Britain starts to fund its navy, starts to kind of take it under its wing. So Japan is very quickly on the rise here. And beginning in 1904, Japan and Russia have already had this major rivalry going on with one another, primarily over mainland China. Okay? The two of them uh, kind of have this sense that they are in direct competition over what they can gain from it, specifically with regard to Manchuria and Mongolia, which you see here kind of in northern China. Okay? Um, and this eventually leads to an escalated fight uh, specifically over China and Korea that's called the Russo-Japanese War. And uh, on February 8th of 1904, um, the Japanese Navy, which again has been sponsored by Great Britain, it's been given all the technology and the advancements, the Japanese come through and they absolutely annihilate the Russian fleet. Okay, and they end up taking control of the Korean Peninsula. Okay, so now the Russians are being driven completely out of Korea, uh, north of the Yalu River. Here you see kind of this northern border of Korea. Here, the river here itself. Um, the other side of the river is currently Chinese territory even today, I believe. Um, so anyway, the the Russians are driven back into Manchuria now, and again. Uh, Japan is proving itself to be a pretty formidable foe at this point. Right? Again, it's had so much patronage and so much sponsorship from Great Britain um, that it's uh, it's not something that the Russians expected. Okay. And Roosevelt sponsors the Treaty of Portsmouth, which uh, is strangely enough signed in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So he brings uh, the Japanese ambassador and the Russian ambassador to New Hampshire of all places and has them sign this treaty basically uh, agreeing that this is going to come to an end. And Russia is forced to basically acknowledge that Japan has interests in Korea um, and that uh, Korea is eventually going to become uh, a territory of Japan, at least at this point in time. 
And Japan does eventually annex Korea in 1910. Okay, so Korea is a, a constantly um, fought over region uh, leading all the way up, uh, again, until probably 1950 when Korea is actually um, uh, directly divided in half and we get the North and the South Korea that we see today. And both powers, too, uh, Russia and Japan, agree to leave Manchuria alone. Okay, Manchuria is, uh, you know, reverts back to Chinese control. Um, and the reason that they fight so much over Manchuria in particular is because it has a lot of mineral deposits. Okay, a lot of uh, areas where iron ore can be harvested. Um, I want to say there's even oil that is uh, in existence there. So there's, a, in, in other words, there's a lot of... Um, um, uh, raw materials, a lot of natural uh, resources that can be harvested from the region. Uh, and again, it's basically just targeted for that reason alone. And so Chinese finally regain control of it. Um, and now the question, though, is that even though the Japanese have kind of proven themselves to be, you know, uh, strong in this case, now the United States is starting to get kind of worried, okay, because the Japanese. Uh, uh, are very, very close uh, to the Philippines, okay? And we still have control of the Philippines as an unorganized territory. We haven't given it back to um, Filipino independence yet. And so now the question is whether or not the Japanese are going to not only take control of Korea, but are they going to go somewhere south and try to invade the Philippines? And again, we end up seeing this actually happen in World War II, okay? But we're still a few decades away from that. William Howard Taft, remember who is the uh, placed as the governor of the Philippines, is sent to Tokyo, and he ends up uh, signing the Taft Katsura Agreement in 1905. And this basically is just kind of a, a friendly agreement between the U.S. and Japan to leave each other's territories alone. Okay, the U.S. says that we acknowledge you have control of Korea. We're not going to mess with Korea, and Japanese have to say we acknowledge you have control of the Philippines, and we're not going to mess with that. Okay, so it's just kind of basically saying. You know, let's not get into a fight with one another over each other's territories. Um, and now that we have kind of gotten into this phase of uh, the U.S. building somewhat of a nativist response, especially to immigrants coming from Southeast Asia, um, there becomes more and more of a, uh, a tension uh, racially and ethnically speaking between the United States and really the rest of the world and Japan at this point. Okay, Japan starts to build itself up as an empire um, and uh, the, the Japanese, at least at this point in time, begin to develop a sense of racial superiority over other um, ethnically Asian peoples in Southeast Asia. So they believe themselves superior to Koreans, to the Chinese, uh, to individuals living in French Indochina, which is now considered Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and all that. So there's a, a lot of... Um, a lot of head scratching basically going on and again immigrants coming to the United States uh, from Japan also have a tough time as well for one thing in 1906 the San Francisco School Board decides that it is going to begin segregating Asian students as well as um, black students and even Hispanic students uh, and Hispanic students just a quick side note, are, are not actually considered a separate ethnic group, probably I think until 1920 or 25. Um, so uh, when, when you look at a U.S. census from the time period, you'll notice that the, um, the, the ratio of whites compared to, to other ethnic groups are actually, it's actually uh, significantly larger than it is today because uh, Hispanics are actually lumped in with whites. Okay? And it's, it's a whole other uh, separate uh, discussion that, that we could have about, um, uh, there's, there's a, a complete book that's been written on this, in fact, uh, called uh, Working Toward Whiteness, and it's a, 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 you know, a discussion about immigrants during this time period who can pass as quote-unquote white, uh, and if you can you know, pass as white, right, there's, there's the whole question of white privilege and all this kind of stuff. So this is a, it's a really, uh, it's a difficult time uh, again, ethnically speaking, right? There's there's all kinds of different questions that come into play. And of course, now that we have all these scientifically driven uh, justifications for uh, for racism, for race, racial uh, or institutionalized racism and that kind of thing, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, again, it's an extremely difficult time if you are a member of a non-white mi non minority or non-white ethnicity, in other words. Um, in response to the San Francisco incident, Roosevelt actually comes out and he forces the school board to change its policy because the Japanese government starts breathing down our necks. 
uh, basically saying, you know, what right do you have to try to do this? Uh, and remember, the Japanese at this point have kind of this sense of superiority attached to themselves, and they believe that if, you know, basically saying, who are you to say that we are, are less than you, right? And to a certain extent, they are absolutely right, right? They are saying that, you know, there, there shouldn't be any difference among ethnicities here. Um, they're, they're not necessarily doing it by saying that we're equals, they're basically saying that they believe themselves to be superior. <laughs> so it's a, it's a strange, um, uh, I don't know, it's a strange dynamic is, is the best way I can put it. Um, and so Japan actually agrees uh, in response to this. Roosevelt makes a deal with them saying that um, if, you, if we agree to stop this policy, you have to basically do what we're doing to the Chinese. You have to stop sending unemployed workers to America. And so um, it's, a, it's another thing that ends up uh, causing some tensions with Japan and probably feeds into um, some of the, uh, the growing tensions leading up to World War II, quite frankly. Um, all the, the different dealings that the U.S. has with Japan leading up to the invasion uh, and the, the destruction at Pearl Harbor especially um, may have its beginnings at this particular point in time. Okay, so we'll kind of see how all this ends up feeding into future events the further along we get into the 20th century.